Welcome to Health, Wellbeing and Lifestyle. And for our first guest today, we have Michelle Richardson, a lymphologist. And today she's here talking to us about the four ways to be more energetic. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you. So can you tell us, how can we build our energy levels? I have many people who come to see me who ask, how can I create energy? And I ask them next is, do you know what it is? People go, no. Well, then if you don't know what it is, how are you going to create it? And energy is all around us, okay? It's in the air, which is, means oxygen, right? By deep breathing. Now, everyone knows that we need oxygen to live, yeah? It's common knowledge, right? So we need to breathe deeper. And they go, I thought I did breathe deeper. I said, well, can you show me how you breathe? And they they normally sit like this, and they go, okay, yeah, I can't hear you. And they go, can you stand up or sit up straighter? Ah, now you're opening your chest, and where does the oxygen have to go to? Oh, I don't know, in the bottom of your lungs. So we've got to be up straight to open up our airway and our lungs and breathe into our armpits, our Pilates train. So I do know a bit about how to get oxygen into the body. And then I said, and most people can't even breathe out for two seconds. So people at home, if they want to create just one, there's four, remember, they want to create one way is to breathe oxygen. So deep breathing, which is into the nose, close your mouth, Okay, you ready? Up nice and tall. Open up the lungs. Breathe in through your nose. Close your mouth. Open your mouth like fogging a mirror. Just by doing that, what are we doing? Increasing our heart rate, which is creating oxygen flow, which is red blood cells around your body to get rid of waste and toxins that have accumulated to stop the energy in our body as well. It doesn't matter if it's late or morning or overcast. I must say you mustn't go out in the hot, hot sun, right? Because that doesn't make us feel good. But in the early morning, just go out and it makes you feel good. It doesn't, and it creates energy. Okay, and that's such a simple, simple technique, right? And that will enhance healing. And what do we all want? Energy to create healing. Yeah, which means less pain, right? Less illness. Maybe a, not being diagnosed with a disease, I don't know. But anything is possible when you learn to breathe. Could you give us some examples of how this has worked for some success stories for people or how it can work for people? I guess there's a lot of women out there who really struggle because they're carrying a lot of weight, right? And just carrying, you think you're carrying an extra five to 10 to 20 or maybe 50 kilos, that's a lot of stress. So you tend to close down your abdominals tend to crunch in, your lungs close in. And I have women who come and just, I make them feel good. It's not about finding a fix for them or anything like that because they can fix themselves by doing a few simple tips. One is oxygen, I just shared with you. And by doing this regularly, right, they start to feel better. It's amazing, and with that, they lose weight, they feel better about themselves, and happy, happy days, and so many, of, and it's a simple technique as well. So lots of, lots of stories. What's another one? Um, a young lady came to me, and she was in pain, and with her, with um, hip and knee, and because I am also Pilates trained, I worked out her posture was incorrect. And because we get in habits and we walk to compensate for that pain, we're actually doing more damage. So then what do we do? Close up into our lungs and we sit forward. We don't want to get up and walk and that's a no-no. We actually have to get up straight and walk so we get oxygen and then the oxygen can take away the waste that's built up around the, say, sore knee or sore hip to replace it with oxygen so the body starts to repair. 
And, and as you were saying earlier with the four ways of doing that, then the other way is? Well, the other ways was bouncing, mm. massage and creating energy. And they're all related by bouncing. And we suggest people that they get on a trampoline and that activates the lymphatic system which starts in the calf muscle, right? Which then gets all your systems activating at once. Then you start to breathe because you need to breathe oxygen to bounce up and down. And, and it's just a great feeling. And the th third one, fourth one actually, is massage. Now this is a very interesting topic because people don't often know well, what is massage or how do you create energy through massage. Well it's a very light touch okay and they've done lots of research throughout the decades about how the energy from one person's hand to another person's hand or body creates electric shock. You've been around people and you get oh in a shock, right? Because we are all energy. You know, you've been in a room with someone or a group of people and you feel amazing. So that's how energy creates the body. So four ways to activate the body is oxygen, deep breathing. I said breathe into the bottom, breathe into your nose and breathe out like fogging a mirror. Second one is re rebounding or movement, jumping up and down. Third one is massage, stroking the body. Just, you know, when you've got elderly parents or anyone who just wants to feel good, what do you do? Massage their back, give them a stroke down the arm. Right? That's moving out the toxins that are making us feel bad. Yeah? And the fourth one is energy, which is in us anyway. Right? The frequency of the cells, which vibrate through everyone that we know, like I just explained before, is when you're in the room with someone you feel good. Follow the four steps of activating the lymphatic system. And you know what, that's hardly spoken of. If you're in surgery or top positions, oh, they'll know what it is, right? Thank you so much, Michelle. And what would you say would be your absolute top tip for our viewers to take with them today? To stand up tall and breathe deeply. That creates the energy inside you, vibrates the cells. To activate all the systems, your blood system, your nervous system, it calms you down just to breathe. I guarantee you'll feel different the minute you go back or walk back into that room or back into that meeting, whatever situation you're in. Thank you so much, Michelle. And for more information on Michelle Richardson and four ways to be more energetic, then please go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. We'll see you after the break. Stay tuned. After the break, health, life and love coach, Heather Bell Murphy is talking about the secrets of long lasting love. Welcome back. We are here with Heather Bell Murphy, a health, life and love coach. And today our topic is healthy eating for a healthy love life. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Kirsty. Now, can you tell me how the two are connected? Absolutely. Love to. Uh, this probably relates more to, to women to, and to female clients that I've worked with previously, having worked in the area of self-love and, you know, and a healthy weight for about the last 25 years. What I commonly find is women will think that um, they're not worthy of having a great relationship with themselves and that of course includes food. It's, it's not like a concept where we become, I would do anything for my children or the family and my significant others or my parents or my best friend or my sister, even the cat and the dog but I don't have to worry about me because I'm going to be the well of sacrifice. And the funny thing is, or the irony there is, of course, that we really need to be the fountain of love. And a fountain self-waters in a way. And it's a really beautiful metaphor where we self-nurture 
and self-water and pay ourselves that respect. And this is what I really find with women and working with women in the dating sense as well, is that we need to love, first love and respect ourselves. Now this is a bit of the paradigm that we're in, that we've been in for the last couple of thousands of years, where we're seen as the other. And so we're not seen as the queen anymore and we don't treat ourselves as the queen. Now, part of the whole picture about loving ourselves first and being worthy and respecting ourselves is that we look after ourselves. And, the, and into, that, into that whole puzzle is going to be the puzzle and the, the pieces of the puzzle around food, choosing healthy foods in healthy amounts and consuming you know, healthy portion sizes. And that will fit into our picture of how we look after ourselves. And then a funny thing to consider is do we really want to take perhaps bad habits that we may have picked up when we were younger and our metabolisms are a bit faster? Are those habits going to serve us going into our greater selves? Because we're only 20 for five minutes, let's face it. You know, the majority of our healthy life is going to be around fitting in with families and, you know, working healthily at a career. That, that's the big part. You know, the teenage fun years and the 20s, they don't last forever. Let's look at those future selves that we're going to take into pr most likely, say, committed long-term relationships. And so it's a really great thing to be thinking about the healthy habits that you adopt then. Heather, what is healthy eating? You're probably aware that diet has changed and nutritional advice has changed a great deal in the last, say, 25 years. Now that's because in the last 20 years with the rise of quantum medicine, science and research into nutrition can now look at the subcellular level. So now we have a much better understanding of how things like sugar and fats are metabolized in our actual cells themselves. So that's had a massive consequence for those high carb diets of the 90s to which I was a victim of. So back in the day, I had a lot of grains. We now know that a high grain diet is quite inflammation making. I was always hungry because it was upsetting my blood sugar levels. So I'm not, I, 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 I don't, instruct clients to an eliminate carbs, of course, but uh, carbs and grains in my diet is a much less of a feature than once upon a time, and it's also going to depend on body type. But as a rule of thumb, if we can stick to things like, I like to say to, 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 to clients, think of your stomach as being, as being three fist sizes so if you eat that much at a time, you're, you're reserving a third of your stomach to actually move the food around and to digest it. So, you know, that's a smallish portion size for a lot of people and it does shock people. Now, of course, if you've got a big day or, you know, you're running a marathon, that's obviously going to change. But we know overall people are consuming too much food and they're often consuming the wrong types, which means not eating food with a, that comes with a skin. It tends to come out of a packet. And everything pretty much that comes in a packet has been altered and interfered with, and it's had added, you know, generally sugar or fat added to it. And so that's a thing to watch instead of eating food in its natural state, in the right quantities at the right time in the right way. Do you have any tips for our audience? I do. A lot has changed from that eating that where, where people have to eat three square meals a day. I would say find a mentor, even if that's via social media, that you would like to emulate. Obviously though, just be aware of keeping it real. We've all seen the social influencers who were sort of about 20. And it's very easy to look fabulous when you're in your 20s. So look for somebody who's perhaps around your age group. 
your kind of body shape, you know, because of course we all know there are examples where women are trying to starve themselves into shapes or, you know, impossibly, um, impossible kind of supermodel kind of things, you know, and then we also, we also realise that, that um, no matter how much, for example, Jennifer Aniston works out, you know, she still wears a lot of makeup, has a lot of spray tan, and then there's photoshopping that goes into that as well. So find somebody, perhaps your age group, your kind of body type, but then also somebody that you may wish to um, look like or emulate that carries you into your best future self by obviously adopting better habits and making healthier choices. Thank you, Heather. That was fantastic. If you want more information on Heather Bell Murphy and healthy eating for a healthy love life, go to her webpage on our website healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au and we'll be right back after this break with another fantastic guest and fascinating topic. Stay tuned. After the break, urban food specialist Mark Noyce will be talking about how to create your own urban edible garden. Welcome back. Our next guest is urban food specialist Mark Noyce and the topic we're here to, to discuss today is how to create your own edible garden. Welcome Mark. Hi Megan, thanks for having me. So Mark, what are some of the challenges we face in creating our own edible garden? I grew up on a market garden uh, myself and I had broad acre farming, I had all the farming tools asso associated with a big urban farm. Uh, and it took a lot of work. But I tell you, when you get into our urban environment where there's a concrete jungle, it's that much harder again to grow your own food at home. So some of the challenges are having the right space, having the right aspects so that you get the right light onto your plants because, you know, let's face it, some plants need a lot more light than others. Lettuce might only need four to five hours a day um, whereas tomatoes and some other sun-loving plants need up to 10 hours a day of sunlight, so they need to be in full sun. So that's a challenge, getting the light and the aspect right, um, getting your nutrition right for your plants, getting the right nutrients in there, getting a high-quality compost or a high-quality potting mix. Uh, that's very important as well to keep that nutrition up to feed the plants. Uh, we all like to get fed well, so do our plants, and they need to get fed well too, to get the best out of them. Another very important thing to remember is having access to water. Plants like water access all the time. If a plant doesn't get, and especially vegetables, if a plant doesn't get what they need in terms of water access, they go, I'm not going to be around here much longer. So I'm going to go to seed. I'm going to fulfill my life's mission and I'm going to just go to seed. And we call that bolting when a vegetable doesn't like uh, its water environment, it gets too stressed. It releases a little hormone that says, hey, go to seed. So getting that water right for your plants, you can either be out there watering all day, uh, you can be out there watering morning, noon and night just to keep that optimal water up to your plants, uh, or you can uh, set your garden up much easier with uh, wicking garden beds, for example. Mark, what are the benefits of having an edible garden? The benefits are just enormous in terms of your mental health, uh, in terms of your physical nutrition, in terms of your connecting with your, with your friends and family and your community. So let's have a look at those um, aspects of an urban edible garden. I love going out to my own garden and knowing where my food comes from, looking at these plants and watching them grow and being part of that and then understanding exactly what I put into those plants so that I know that I'm getting really fresh organic produce that is just uh, tasty and nutritious and just fantastic to eat. The benefits also getting involved in knowing where your food comes from and also communicating with your friends and family that maybe you haven't seen for a while. So let's grow some beetroots. Grow some beetroots and then make some beetroot relish and in a very small place you can grow three kilos of beetroot in two months 
in half a square metre make a relish that can go to five or six people in your family. And your friends will love you. And not only that, you're getting a, so much satisfaction out of growing your own food. You're getting a lot of satisfaction about getting in contact with people that you might not have seen for a while. And you're starting that conversation again. You're increasing your mental health. You're helping others. And then you can give back something to your community as well. On a broader scale, you can grow food for your neighbours. You can get people involved uh, into a community garden. And you can just have uh, an enormous uplifting of self-confidence and community confidence about closing your, um, your nutrient loops, reusing water for food, and I'm just rambling on, I shouldn't have said that. Mark, can I grow the same plant over and over again? Well, you can, but if you don't do certain things to keep ensuring that the potting mix is fresh, uh, if you don't remove the uh, biomass that's, you know, the root systems, the, the stem of the plant, for example, you can't just keep planting in the same spot all the time. You know, it's gardening 101. You, know, you look at our farmers, our farmers turn over the soil and they recompost and they re-add nutrient and, and they just make sure that the, the growing media is fresh and optimal after every season that the vegetables come out of. We've got to do the same for our own environment, our own containerized growing in urban environments. So yes you can, but if you don't refresh your potting mix, if you don't deal with the biomass that's created when a vegetable puts its tremendous root systems uh, down, then you're not going to get the best out of it. And some plants really suck the nutrient out of potting mix. And let's face it, what a plant is doing is it's taking that energy that's in the potting mix and they're converting it into biomass uh, and something yummy that we like to eat. So it's just a big energy transfer. So when that vegetable's done, we've got to put more energy back into the soil. And that's through refreshing the compost, refreshing the potting mix with either nutrient, soluble fertiliser, uh, or some of our green waste. We can actually green, put our green waste back into the soil to grow more nutritious food. That's fantastic. So Mark, what's some advice you've got for our audience in creating their own edible garden? My advice would be to think about what you're going to grow. Think about where you're going to grow it. Think about what you're going to grow it in uh, and then make a plan. We need to also think about how we're going to manage our vegetable garden, uh, our edibles, by getting the right sunlight, getting the right aspect, protecting them from bugs uh, with either netting, protecting them to, from really harsh conditions like wind through netting and shade cloth, uh, and thinking about crop rotation, thinking about what am I going to plant in the potting mix after my tomatoes come out, and maybe you put onions in there, you know, and then you swap that over after you've reset your nutrition in your potting mix. Wow, that's fantastic. Thanks so much for that great information, Mark. If you'd like to know more about Mark Noyce and how to create your own edible garden, please go to his webpage on our website, healthwellbeinganlifestyle.com.au. And that's all for us today, so we'll say bye-bye for now, and we'll see you next week. If you'd like to know more about our show, please like our Facebook page and also subscribe to our YouTube channel.